director for Electric Arts Mythic. He's overseeing the design of, uh, of the upcoming massively multiplayer online role-playing game, blah, Warhammer, Warhammer Online, and uh, he's a pioneer in game design. Paul is who's going to describe the evolution of massive, uh, massive multiplayer environments and hopefully explain why I'm wearing these sunglasses. It's very bright up here. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Wow, it's only when you see an enormous TV screen that you go, I really should have brought some slides. That would probably have been really helpful. I haven't got any, so you've got a picture of me. That's the best you're going to get. So what do I do? I look after, um, I'm a creative director, uh, which is, means I've got a job no one really understands. Um, what I basically do is there's a big vision design idea done by the studio head, and then there is a raft of people who all do a lot of hard work and my job is to work as a sort of in be go between, a cipher, some sort of like true magnetic north to be able to say this is basically where we're trying to go. Remember, fun, try not to cost us too much money. Remember, we need to do it on time. How about bigger rabbits? Bigger rabbits might be a really good idea. Go away, make them bigger. And um, that's basically what I do. And uh, I do it in the online space. And like any new emergent area, we have gone out of our way to fill it full of gibberish words that nobody understands. So that when we talk about it, everybody goes, I don't really understand what he's saying. He's talking about things, uh, uh, MSGs. I don't really know what they are. So I thought I'll try and strip quite a lot of that away so we can talk to normal people because they're important too. So what do we actually deal with? We deal with lots of people online doing stuff. That's basically it. Lots of people online doing things. And the problem is that that topic is so large that I can't talk about it. So what I thought I'd do is I'd crush down the bits that I know nothing about and ignore them and only talk about the bits that I'm mildly competent on. So one of the things you can do when you've got lots of people online doing stuff is you can socialize. Hello, I'm a Capricorn. I've just made this pot. I really like this band. I live in Scarborough. Oh, look, this picture is really interesting. That's what they call social networking. Apparently, it's massively popular and theoretically worth billions and billions of dollars. I don't know anything about it. People who are much cleverer than me can tell you about it. But that's an entire chunk of lots of people online doing stuff that I'm not going to be talking about. Very interesting. There's also a second part of lots of people online doing stuff. And this is where they're making things and showing them off. And people are coming along and having a look at them. User-generated, lots of people online doing stuff. Comes in lots of formats. I make custom cars. Look at my engine. I baked this cake. Or in a more common format, read my blog. Or I borrowed a video camera. My cat was sick all over my grandma, and I videoed it. <laughs> Would you like to watch it? It's quite amusing. Please send it to as many people as possible. User-generated content, all that sort of stuff, that sort of things like YouTube, um, uh, you know, live video, and also all the blog spaces and that. Another huge chunk of the online space that I don't know anything about. I'm not talking about that either. You can go and find people who are very clever. They can tell you about it. So I'm talking about a very thin bit right down the middle. And uh, it's, a bit of, it's a bit of a strange word, not a word you hear a lot around the internet. It's entertainment games that make old-fashioned profit. Real money. Now, it might not be a term we're too used to in this room. I'll explain it to you. you. There's an amount of money you have, and this is making a game and marketing it and running it. And then there's an amount of money you take off people because they joyously love what you do, and they really love it, and they like it, and they go, I like that so much, I'm going to pay money for it. Like they do with food. <laughs> that stuff, you know, relevant to your existence. So, when they get there and they go, this is relevant to my existence, I'm going to give them money. Because they do it, and they do it really well, and I really like it, and I'm really excited, and I love them. You then take one number away from the other. Hopefully, it's a positive number. That's called profit. And that's the stuff that I like doing. And it's very important, because it's how I afford my house and that food stuff. So very, very relevant. And what I try to do is I try to get as many people as I like involved in it to make something joyous and wondrous that will make money. And the sort of stuff is, it's the sort of money my mum approves of. She understands that. She doesn't actually know what I do for a living, but she does understand when I buy her nice presents. 
And there's all the stuff bank managers like. So that they can say, so there's a business plan, is there? And usually with internet stuff, the business plan is a bit weird. It's full of things like, so you don't actually make anything? No. You don't have any stock? No. People are doing something virtually? Yes. You don't give them anything? No. And you want how much? $758 million. And will it make any money? Maybe. Perhaps. Um, so I just deal with that. The, the commercial making money entertainment business, which is huge, makes a lot of money. Help, thankful, helpful. In fact, it makes so much money that we don't really understand it. And we don't really know why it works. And we don't really know how to make games. And that's the bit I'm going to talk about. So that's, that's where we're staying. So I tried to think of two things I could talk about that sort of encapsulate what I do. And I decided there was two things that I liked. One, the history of cinema. Two, Vegas casinos. Put them together, that's what I do for a living. Doesn't make much sense to start with, bear with me. We're all often saying to people that computer games are like the movie industry. Well, they're not. That is a lie perpetuated by people in the computer games industry. Because we want to be cool. And we don't like the fact that we live in little cubicles where it's cold and damp and we collect man dolls. Sorry, posable collectible action figures. Dolls for men. And we sit there with our man dolls in our little cubes and we go, wouldn't it be much better if we told people we did something cool? So we tell people we're like the movie industry, we're not, nothing like it, we don't know anything about it, except in two areas. Area number one, just like mainstream movies, computer games generally have too many people working on them, cost too much money, take too long, um, miss all their deadlines, and when you experience them, you go, I could do better than that. Just like movies. The second thing we're like is the history of cinema, and I'll explain that one. The history of cinema, and quite, this is one of those things you have to open your mind to it. Cinema went through major changes. Not small ones, major ones. I'll give you an example. Sound. You won't believe it. Entire careers ruined. Studios destroyed. Colour. Colour came along, and, and again, hard to believe. For a while, they still made black and white movies, because they went, it might not catch on. It could be a fad. I'm not sure we like it. TV came along, and this is really stretching it, you probably won't believe me. We put the goggle box in the corner, and they were convinced movies were dead. Same thing happened with video. Oh my god, they can video things, that'll be it. Portable camcorders, digital DVD, my lord. And now you look at movies, digital making, CGI, the ability to do digital downloads, digital right management, and on and on and on. And yet, and yet, movies flourish. And I thought to myself, that's very peculiar, how did they manage that? And I came up with three answers. Answer number one, it happened over quite a long, long period of time, 50 odd years. That's quite handy, get time to get used to that, roll with the punches. Answer number two, they had generational thinking. They had very rich people who'd seen it all before, who basically went, steady, steady, it'll all be all right. Third, they had an absolute guaranteed model. We get some people in a room, we film them, we print it, we put it in the cinema, take money, and then we go into secondary markets, make more money, it works. And you equate that to the computer games industry and all sorts of interesting things happen. We don't go through these changes. We don't have five changes in 50 years. We get 50 changes every five years, which is really, really irritating and bothersome. We don't have any generational thinking because most of the people who work in our industry are first time round and the ones who are successful build rockets to the moon and never come back and tell us what happened. It's true. And our technology keeps changing so we don't know how to make these bloody games. It's really, really, really horrible. But the real killer, the thing that gets us is that for all our money that we create, for all the data we've got, and my heck, have we got some data, for all that, we are incapable of answering, in the online market, some really basic questions. We have not a Scooby-Doo clue what platform is going to be dominant. We don't know. Is it going to be PCs? Is it going to be web-based? Maybe the console is the answer. I'm telling you it's the iPhone. Mobile gaming is the future. Put it down onto your TV. That's the way forward. No, no, no. It's some gibberish that I saw when I was off on another conference. It's this. It's, I'm telling you, cans of soup. We'll be playing games on cans of soup. We haven't a clue. We don't know the platform. We don't even know the game. 
And you can prove that by people putting up lots of graphs where they go, the answer is driving go-karts. The answer is breeding ponies. The answer is shooting people in a sort of crazy way. The answer is building houses. It's a physics engine. It's a flower arranging. It's a, we don't know. We've not got a clue. And then we go, we don't know what type of game it is. It's a game you have to spend 50 hours on a day. <laughs> Spoken by people who have raised billions. No, it's a game you have to play for a nanosecond. It's a game that gets beamed directly into your head. It's a game that's played by people who are over the age of 60. We don't know. We also don't know how to monetize it. Oh, sure, we can make money, but we're not too sure what the monetization route is. Do you basically go up, you, it's an all-you-can-eat buffet. Um, actually, you can play our game for free, but would you like a big hat? have to pay for that. We're going to nickel and dime you. No, actually, we're going to insist you buy an enormous console to play it on. We don't know. And probably the worst bit we have is all the games that we can see online that appear to make money were built years ago. Now that's not a problem if your market's staying still. It's a real problem when the market keeps moving. So you look at games that are successful and you think we should make that. Not realizing that when it was designed and when it was built, loads of technological joy didn't exist. Loads of people who weren't on the internet now are. Loads of information has just changed, and now I've got to waste hundreds of millions of dollars, perhaps making a game that maybe will make some money. That's why they hire people like me. Because I can go, well, I've got an idea. Maybe go in that direction. And they go, oh, that's good. We'll go there. So, history of cinema, that's the online space, very difficult. That then leads to casinos in Vegas, a little route. And that route is our designers. And that gets to the core of what I do. Why is online games, why are they fantastic? Why are they awesome? Why should everyone be take, paying attention to them? Because they're great. Because I, I earn money when you buy them. It's very important. We know they're great, they're interesting. And they're interesting for multiple reasons. And the most important one for me is the following. When you look at single game design, and for that I mean card games, board games, I mean all the types of design you get, games out in the playground, we've actually discovered most of the sphere. We've mapped the globe. We're pretty confident we know how to make single-player games. We've figured most of them out. It's like we've got the satellite photography. There are no more dragons left to slay. There's no more islands to discover. Sure, there's a few pieces we haven't discovered. Every now and then we get caught off guard. But on the whole, the boundaries are set. The online space is basically a little tiny island with huge oceans of unknown everywhere. And that's really exciting, because you go, lots of things to play for. We're not too sure what the answer is. And then you have these people, good ship pioneers, building boats made out of money, piling them with explorers, intelligent, aggressive people, heading out into the ocean, on the whole, running adrift on reefs of despair, being destroyed by the weathers and vagaries of destiny, being eaten by the monsters of the unknown unlucky, or landing in unknown lands where they get boiled alive. But a few, just a few, come back on their ships and say, we have discovered new land, and it is rich, very rich, hugely rich. It's so rich, we built another 20 boats to bring all the money back. And then we're on our little islands, and we're going, Christ, that looks really quite, that's quite exciting, isn't it? We should build a boat. What should we do? Build a bigger boat. We'll go in that direction. And, and that's what we're doing. That's why the online space is fun. That's why it draws new thinkers in. So that leads me to my two designer types that I look after. There's two that I have to pay attention to. Designer type number one, very nice designers, competent. I call them experiencers. These are the sort of designers who can come to me and can tell me anything, anything, about a game that they've played. They can point out a great mechanic, they can tell me something wondrous, they can value anything that they've seen. What they're lousy at is making intuitive leaps. And, and, and so they're, they're nice, don't get me wrong, that's a good model, that's a good model for designers. It's, it's nice, it's safe. And the other extreme of the designers I look after are designers who design for designers. You'll know those people, they speak gibberish. They're very, very clever. They use words no one understands, and they make things no one can comprehend. They cost a lot of money, and you just have to believe them. Now, every now and then, they produce astounding things. Will Wright made an astounding leap. He, he took design 
and gave it to the user. Why don't you design for a while? Yeah, so they do astounding things, but they're bonkers and, and highly dangerous. My job is to push them together and to forge a third way where we go, why don't we try and be a little bit more exciting than your dull bit, and why don't we not put flying hippopotamuses in it, Let's take all those ideas off the crazy tray, and push you together, and maybe you can come up with something a little bit more deliverable with a bit of vision. That's what I do. Which led me to casinos in Vegas. I was getting there. There's a little road. I was in Vegas, minding my own business, as you do, and it struck me about the casinos. I noticed a couple of things. Thing number one, there's a lot of people working on them. They take a long time to build. They're never done on time. They cost a fortune. And when they're finally built, you walk into them and go, I could build a better one than this. I suppose in some ways, they're like the film industry. And the thing about casinos is they're heavily themed. Big themes. I'm a Roman casino. I'm a movie casino. And what they do is they draw you in. Come into our casino. Come make yourself at home. They welcome you. They teach you how to do the things that they do in casinos. They manage the casino and they say, we don't want these people. They haven't got any money and they might smell. We like these people who have money and we'll look after them. And they manage the community and they, they make you feel warm and welcome and slowly but surely lead you through all the different ways of experiencing a casino, getting slightly more complicated, and all the time ensuring that you honor their subscription model, which is you give them money, they'll give you free drink, you go home. Pretty much the model they use. It's very, very good. And the thing about casinos is you get casino thinking. And this was brought home to me. I was wandering along, minding my own business, like you do in Vegas. And I got offered this drink, this crazy themed drink in like a pot with a straw. And it was like a litre of vodka. And I thought to myself, that's probably a bad idea. <laughs> and it was like $5. I thought, oh, I'll buy it because you know, I quite like the look of it. It looks mad. And then I noticed other people walking around with a... And they were looking around. But what happened is I went to the next casino down the strip and they had a drink, but clearly their drink had arrived after this drink. Because they'd gone, that's a really good idea. We should take that and innovate. And they had two handles on theirs and two straws. And it was a litre and a half of vodka. Right there, you see, they've made that intuitive leap into design. And as you worked your way down the strip, the drinks got more and more preposterous and more and more ridiculous. The last one, I, I, had to, I, I said no in the end, the last one came with a parking space, a spa, a rocket ship to the moon, and get this, four straws. And, and this happens everywhere in Vegas. They've got a firework display, we'll have a firework display. It's the American system, bigger, faster, louder, higher. What are you doing? Is it making money? Then we'll do more of them, more aggressively, more interestingly, it's going to be great. And that's the problem with online game design. The problem, the challenges we have, is you, you can't do that. Casino thinking is not going to help you. And the reason it's not going to help you is because some of the ideas that the casinos have got were really, really stupid and cost a lot of money and were worthless. But because everyone emulated it and everyone thought they had to copy it, we all end up having to watch terrible firework displays. Because we haven't got the strength and courage to go, I think that might be a bit rubbish. I think we might have to go in this direction here, where it might be a bit more exciting. So, online space. It's really exciting. It's really interesting. It's doing lots of innovative things. It's where new design thinking is happening. How do you expand it and do better? Well, you take all your computer game people, and you make them come to places like this. Because if we have a sin, one of our sins is that we're massively insular and inward looking. And if we want to progress, and we want to embrace online, and we want to be brilliant, and we do, then we need to open our minds to new thinking, stop acting like casinos, and realize that change is the inevitable burden of the online industry. And we need to embrace it and be excited about it. Which is why I'm the only creative director I could find from EA who came to Lyft. But you know, I learned loads of really cool stuff like aerials that look like trees. So, you know, I'm really happy. That's it. That's all I've got. I'm sorry there was no slides. Enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you.